If you stubbed your toe right now, what sound would you make? According to linguists, the chances are pretty good that your answer would be surprisingly similar to one given by someone on the other side of the planet, even if you speak totally different languages. For Scientific American, I'm Rachel Feltman. I'm here today with our friend Allison Parshall, an associate news editor at Scientific American who often covers biology, health, technology, and physics. She recently wrote about a study that focused on the words humans use to express pain and the wild similarities between those exclamations around the world. Allison, thanks for coming on to chat. Hopefully it won't be too painful. <laughs> Ouch. That's all I have to say. So why are linguists talking about pain? Well, linguists are talking about everything always. Talking about talking. But linguists are talking about pain because the words that we use to express it might actually tell us something about our shared biology and the evolution of kind of language in general. It's a pretty big topic. It's part of why I'm so interested to talk about it today. But this particular discovery actually started out pretty small with a French language researcher named Maya Ponsonnet and what she calls a pretty, quote, naive observation. She was does a lot of research on language and emotion, and she was in Australia studying Aboriginal languages when she noticed that the words many of those languages use to exclaim their pain, like ouch in English, sound similar to exclamations of pain in her native French. So that word in many Aboriginal languages sounds something like yagai, and in French it's ai, and in English it's ow. Do you know any in any languages? Yeah, I used to study Mandarin, and I remember that there's an I in there, I I O, and I'm terrible with my tones, so don't. I think it's first tone for both. Yeah, it's first tone for both, which I remember because it feels so appropriate for an exclamation of pain. <laughs> You're like high-pitched yelling. Basically. Yeah, exactly. I have studied and failed to master many languages in my life, including Italian and Spanish. And I think in both, I is just a very common exclamation of pain. Yeah, there's a lot of I. Basically, wherever you look around the world, you'll get a lot of I, you'll get a lot of ow, you'll get a lot of ah. In Japanese, it's itai. I don't actually speak Japanese at all, so hopefully that's not totally wrong. Um, but so you might be seeing a pattern here. And basically, Maya Ponsonne, when she was doing her research, noticed this pattern. She made this observation, but like two languages, what can you really conclude from that? Nothing. So they decided to do a much broader scale study. There's not a lot of research looking into this type of word. It's called an interjection. So like, ouch, or wow, or yay. And basically, they surveyed 131 languages from dozens of language families around the world. They gathered these exclamation words for pain as well as for joy and disgust. So like, ouch, yay, and yuck, respectively. And then they found that when it comes to pain, her observation was not a superficial similarity at all. These pain interjections, but not joy and disgust interjections, we'll get to that, are more similar to each other across languages than they are to other words in their language that aren't pain interjections. So ouch and I are more similar to each other than ouch is to other words in English and I is to other words in pick a language that I is in. Italian. 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 Spanish. Yeah, Spanish. <laughs> Basically, it showed that it seems likely that this isn't a coincidence and that there's some sort of hidden factor that we humans all have in common that has shaped these words similarly. Wow, that's really cool. And I also love that it started with, you know, what the researcher calls a naive observation, because it is the kind of thing that was right in front of us all along. And you have to wonder how many people were like, that's a silly comparison I just made. There's obviously no real connection there. So really cool that she explored it. So when we say that these are similar sounds, you've talked about this a little bit, but exactly what sounds are we discussing? We're basically talking about this ah sound in I and in ow, you can hear that both of those start the same. They both start with ah. They're what we call diphthongs. So it basically is two vowels right next to each other. So there you could have ah, or you could have ai, or you could have ow. And so in English, ouch kind of has that ah sound, even though we spell it with an o, and we think of ah typically being an a. But phonetically, they're very related. So it's possible that ah is also just a really common sound in language, and maybe that was why it was popping up in these pain interjections. But the researchers compared these pain interjections to other words of the same length in each language and found that, no, these ah sounds actually are just more common in pain interjections than they are in other words across the board, basically. Hmm. So I guess my question is, like, if you were the scientist and you'd seen that data, you're seeing these ah sounds popping up all over in pain interjections, do you have any ideas of what you might think up as a hypothesis to explain it? I feel like 
I would be tempted to hypothesize that there's something innate about the experience of pain that relates to these sounds, like maybe something about our physiological reaction to pain. I don't know. I'm I'm not a linguist, so. (laughs) (laughs) Well, if I went over and pinched you, what sound might you make? Just like involuntarily. Probably like, yeah. Yeah. Ah. So uh, the researchers basically had the same idea. They thought like, well, maybe these noises that we make involuntarily, just kind of these primal sounds, maybe for pain, it does kind of sound more like an ah sound across the board. Of course, we don't even necessarily know that that's true. These like more primal vocalizations that aren't language, but still communicate something are not super widely studied. So what the researchers did is gathered samples of these non-word vocalizations from five languages and cultures around the world for pain, joy, and disgust. So I guess you could imagine, ah, for pain, e for joy, and ugh for disgust would (laughs) maybe be what I would do if I was prompted. And they found that for disgust, the most common vowel sounds in these, so kind of like I just said, ugh, you can hear it. For joy, it was e, so kind of like what I just said. And for pain, it was that familiar ah sound. So this held true across five different cultures and language groups, which does seem to support their hypothesis. It suggests that it's possible that these ah-based pain words from across the world are in some way similar because of a common origin in these like more primal noises that we make. The study can't really prove that. That's a very difficult thing to prove. But it suggests that we might say ouch or ai or yagai because at one point, all of our ancestors were just screaming ah. So you mentioned joy and disgust. Are we seeing these kind of phonetic similarities in the linguistic expression of other emotions? Not in the linguistic expression necessarily. So interestingly, the study of vocalizations found for joy and disgust across those five different languages, you had similarities like joy was e and disgust was uh, but that did not translate to like the linguistic words that we use. So basically, like if disgust vocalizations were uh in English for a disgust interjection in the linguistic world, you might say yuck. Right. Or um, ew. Yeah. Exactly. And like you can see there's more cultural layers being added here. There's a bunch of things you could say to convey your disgust in terms of interjections. And the theory that the researchers had for why joy and disgust don't seem to have this similarity in the words we use to describe them. So as those layers differ between cultures, the words we use to express them are going to evolve to sound very different, even if they all kind of did start from the same place as that primal sound of ugh. But pain is a feeling. It's not really an emotion. Like, I feel like it's kind of misclassified to say pain is an emotion. It's like more of a physiological response. You could argue that disgust is too. For sure, there's some sort of like physiological thing we have, like the gag reflex. But pain is subjective and complicated and it does differ across cultures, but our bodies do have like literal pain receptors that either fire or they don't. So it's possible that might be why it's the only response they saw here that has similar vocalizations and interjections across languages. So what can that tell us about language? It's all very hypothetical, but it's all so interesting to me. And (laughs) that's what really gets me about this is the idea that there are these more like primal, mysterious, unseen forces that are shaping the words that we humans develop to describe the world, regardless of where you're from on the planet. This is pretty new because for a long time, there was this really dominant idea in the field of linguistics that language is fundamentally arbitrary. So what I mean by arbitrary is that like, The sounds kind of don't matter. We just kind of tie them to meaning and make them have meaning, but that the sounds themselves don't have any meaning. Like when I say bird to you and you think of a bird, that's just because you've learned to associate b uh, or d with a bird, not because there's anything bird-like about those sounds I just made. In fact, one of my my cousin-in-law's baby, who is German and learning English as a second language, uses the word bird to talk about any animal that excites her and by extension, really anything that excites her. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> really anything. I feel like that's that's quite common with kids, too. And so the, the idea was that the sounds themselves are arbitrary. But we know that that's not right because language is full of non-arbitrariness. Like, for example, there's automatopoeia. Can you think of any of your favorite automatopoeia, which are splat? Words, splat. Yeah, it's a great one. Crunch. Crackle. Mm, those are good ones. Yeah. I like boom. Oh, boom is Swish great. Swish is fun because it really invokes yeah. the, like, sh- you know? Yeah, hiss. Yeah. But so these are words that basically reflect how we're basically trying to use a word to replicate a sound. Right. 
And that can do some interesting things like putting a B in front of things that we think of as more like explosive, like boom or blast or bang. I mean, there is something buh that, that is to literally a plosive consonant is what linguists call it. There's air exploding from your mouth. So there's all of these really subtle associations we can make. And I did want to ask, have you heard of the booba kiki effect? You know I have. <laughs> <laughs> can you recount the booba kiki effect for me? Yes. The booba kiki effect is the fact that at least among English speakers, and I think some other languages too, people associate booba, but also like B sounds in general, with sort of soft rounded, squishy things and kiki and similar sounds to spiky shapes. And there's like the booba and the kiki shape that are used in this study, but it's also sort of more broadly. It's like there are spiky words and <laughs> there are squishy words. Yeah. I mean, I, I love your response, too, because I get to say, like, it's definitely not just English. The cool thing about it is it's basically like languages and cultures all around the world. It's been replicated pretty well. Um, if you give someone two shapes, one is bulbous and one is spiky and you ask which one is booba and kiki, <laughs> they will tend to put booba with the rounded one and kiki with the spiky one. But I did just kind of like tip my hand there a second because I called them bulbous and spiky. Right, yeah. But you can hear bulba, booba, spiky, kiki. Like you can hear it in there. And this finding has been replicated a lot and there's other ones too. So really recently, researchers found an even stronger association that the trilled R sound, so the R sound, is associated with roughness and the L sound or what we would say is L in English is associated with smoothness. And that's across the world. That's even in languages that don't use these phonemes in their language or that group R and L sounds together as the same phoneme like Japanese. And I just think that's so cool, especially because... Of course, we're going to hear the sound r and think instinctively to make a metaphor to texture, right? Like it sounds rough and ragged and ridged. I'm not even really cherry picking here. Like I tried to look up synonyms for rough yeah. that started with L, for example, and I couldn't find any. This is all <laughs> cherry picked, but like still. But L, you can think of like lilting, flowing, gliding, silky. Mm. We have these associations, even if they're kind of flying under our radar perceptually. And that's what the linguists are all trying to find. And I think they're so cool. It just there's so many of these little associations we don't even know to make. For example, like even within specific languages, there's things called phonoasthemes. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. These don't generalize across languages generally. But like in English, for example, the phonoastheme gl is often associated with light. So like glow or glimmer. And I just think that's so interesting. We don't tend to notice these, but by doing a really careful look across one language or across as many languages as you can pull together, you can kind of start to see these patterns that go under the radar. And it raises the questions of why it's like that. Yeah, totally. Well, speaking of questions, what are the next big ones to answer here? The big question is basically like, what else is out there? The researchers, to follow up on this study specifically, they are curious if maybe they would see different results if they looked at consonants and not just vowels. So in some languages, words that evoke or respond to disgust use this consonant that we don't tend to have a lot in English, but that goes like h. Huh. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. It's represented by an X in the International Phonetic Alphabet. Or maybe there's like plosive consonants like B or P, like B, P, T. Maybe those are more common in disgust. I'm just throwing things out there. There's no necessary reason to think that it's like that. But like, what are the other hidden similarities in the ways that we talk? And Ponsonet and her colleagues are actually using AI now to try to uncover more of those similarities, which is kind of the thing that AI was always really good at, right? Just ingesting a ton of data and telling researchers where there might be a signal and connections that like our human eyes can miss. So I definitely am excited to stay tuned and have my mind blown by future little hidden symbolisms. Yeah, absolutely. I saw that you recently uh, put together a roundup of like this and a few other studies on language from 2024. Are there any other favorites you want to share from those highlights? This is a kind of similar to this finding, at least I was thinking about this a lot when writing the story, but we had an article about this study that aims to understand why some words in a language survive and other ones go extinct. Kind of like what are the rules for survival of the fittest for language? Because we know that our vocabularies expand and contract, like some words go out of existence and some new ones get born. 
So in this study, the researchers basically had people play this big game of telephone. They had a story that the participants were told, and then the participants had to remember and rewrite that story for other participants. And they found that more concrete words lasted longer than more abstract ones, um, more emotionally exciting words, whether they were positive or negative, lasted longer, and also words that were acquired at a younger age. So this paring down doesn't necessarily reduce language to baby talk over time, but you could think of it as like making language more efficient, which I thought was a kind of interesting dynamic. And then, of course, we pull in new complicated words as we go to suit our needs. Sure. Brain rot. Brain rot. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> which I hope, I don't hope is dead. I just think that now once Oxford English Dictionary gets a hold of it, <laughs> it should be. <laughs> yeah. I think we might be done saying it. This one isn't really linguistics, but researchers have come a really long way in brain computer interfaces, which it might be a little overly simplistic to call them mind reading devices, but they're basically mind reading devices. Right. They're literally mind reading, not necessarily what people think of when they say mind reading. <laughs> yeah. They're not, but like they're able to look at the brain with like take measurements from the brain using electrodes and then translate that into coherent speech. And this has been a slow process of it getting slowly better and better and better. But it seems like this year we hit a really important milestone, which is there was a man with ALS who was part of a clinical trial and he regained the ability to talk to his family. Researchers now say that the technology is at the level of quality where it can actually be useful to patients. Mm -hmm. Like it's correct enough of the time that it's the kind of thing people can really start using, which is wow. pretty incredible. Yeah. And then also one of the more fascinating brain language stories I got to read this past year was from Siam's very own copy editor, Emily Mikowski. And she wrote about her experience with something called ticker tape synesthesia, which I had never heard of, but is fascinating. Basically, whenever she hears or thinks words, she basically gets like mental subtitles that mm. kind of scroll in front of her eyes. And it's not something she can turn off. I think she describes it as at times helpful, at times annoying. And her story of how she came to discover that that was the case for her fairly recently, I thought was very funny and interesting. So I would really recommend uh, reading her story about it. Wow. Yeah, I somehow missed that one. So I will definitely have to check it out. And it seems like there were a lot of cool linguistics findings in 2024. And this ouch study is right up there. So thanks so much for coming to talk to us. Thanks for having me. That's all for today's episode. We'll be back on Monday with our usual science news roundup. Science Quickly is produced by me, Rachel Feltman, along with Fonda Mwangi, Kelso Harper, Madison Goldberg, and Jeff Delvisio. Today's episode was reported and co-hosted by Allison Parshall. Emily Mikowski, Shana Posis, and Aaron Shattuck fact-check our show. Our theme music was composed by Dominic Smith. Subscribe to Scientific American for more up-to-date and in-depth science news. For Scientific American, this is Rachel Feltman. Have a great weekend. Have a great weekend.